This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. My name is Beverly Burns and I practice traditional Chinese medicine up at the Osher Center and for those of you who haven't been to the Osher Center, first of all, welcome. We're thrilled to have you here for one of our lunchtime lectures. We appreciate the opportunity to share information with the community and to give you some exposure to our providers. So I was asked and happily agreed to introduce our two massage therapists, but I want to open by saying something that I think is really important. I believe many people come to the Osher Center for treatment thinking that they have the cream of the crop of providers and that's true. We worked really hard to get that to be true. And what I would like for the community to recognize more is that's also true with our massage therapists. And I believe there's a way in which massage therapy is sometimes compared uh, in a very casual way. And these two women are amazing. And you can't, you rarely can find this level of experience. So first, let me start with Marcia Dingleman, who so I want to say across the board, both of these women have been practicing over 30 years. So the amount of education and therapy that they have provided in that time is uh, just tremendous, but not just that, the quality is amazing. And Marcia has recently wit written a book, which you can see up here, called Explaining Health. And in that, she includes some of the pearls of wisdom she found in all of her work with the many people she provides care to. And she does that here at the Osher Center. She also does that for patients and staff on the oncology floor in the pediatric unit at UCSF. And so I feel like that information at least carries you pretty far, letting you know on top of that, Marcia does lymphatic drainage for people who have had sometimes issues related to surgeries that happen most often for cancer. So the breadth of her experience and the depth is absolutely wonderful. And then if I go on to Paula, I, I can say almost exactly the same thing except in different areas. Paula's been working over 30 years. She's been studying and teaching. I used to work at a clinic and the number of people who would say to me, Paula was one of my teachers. She was absolutely wonderful. We loved her, was very high. And, and lastly, I think it's important to note about Paula that she likes to work particularly with people who have been uh, had some experience with post-traumatic stress syndrome because she knows her work is beneficial in that area and she also likes very much to work with the people who are struggling through some of the experiences caused by post-traumatic stress. So again, if you could appreciate the level of their experience and how much they have to offer and spread that word, I, I think that would be the best thing you could do. Here we go. Thank, thank you, Beverly. I'm going to turn it over to Paula for the introduction. Yes, we planned, in fact, to start with just taking a moment to give attention to our own bodies. So I invite you to soften your eyes or close your eyes and take a moment to feel the weight of your body on the chair, to feel the contact 
of your feet with the floor to feel the clothing on your skin, anything you're holding or chewing, to feel the air which is surrounding all of us, and to feel the rhythm of your breathing, to feel the intake of that air and the exhale. Just take a moment to give attention to your own sensations and feelings. And then with your attention on yourself, on your body, see if there's a place or places that would like to be subtly moved or opened up. It might be a tight place. It might be that you're sitting in an uncomfortable way. Take a few moments to adjust, to adjust your posture, um, to maybe touch yourself in a tight spot like your shoulder, um, and just feel those changes in your body as you adjust to a more comfortable position. And then shifting your focus again to simply feeling all your body sensations, all your feelings that are available to you at this point in time. And when you're ready, you can bring your attention back to the whole room. Thanks. And I always try to remember that I can take a moment to do that any time I'm feeling like I need to be quiet. It takes almost no time. Um, and body awareness is a big part of what massage can teach us as individuals. And Marcia and I have been working together here at the Osher Center for um, almost 10 years that we've been working together. And it's really exciting to me that we can come together today and have a presentation in which we talk about uh, not only body awareness as a benefit of massage, but also other kinds of benefits of massage. And um, also give you a, a listing of modalities that have influenced us and in that we tend to use in our own practice. Um, I'm looking forward to sharing these things with you. And at the end of the hour that we have together, we're going to leave some time for you to get, give us comments or ask us questions. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Marcia. Thank you, Paula. I'm glad that you started us with an experience because Talking about massage is kind of funny because massage really has nothing to do with words. It's really an experience. I, I like to think of it as taking people on a guided journey through their bodies. But, uh, you know, we've, we have managed to come up with some words here, so let's see. So uh, some of these slides are from uh, a talk I gave at the Integrative uh, Medicine Forum, which is uh, attended by medical students. So this is just, some of this is a little bit technical, but see what you can get out of it. Um, one of the things about massage therapy is so obvious, but it's non-invasive. And you think about a lot of conventional medicine, a lot of things that happen to people in the hospital are really invasive. So massage therapy is, is really different because it's, it's non-invasive. It doesn't hurt. It feels good most of the times. Uh, massage therapy is a natural pain reliever, and in fact, it helps people take less pain medicine sometimes. It's an anxiety reducer, and one of the things that I do is I work at the, um, on the pediatric floor of uh, 
UCSF and Parnassus, and I work on the parents of the pediatric patients. And that is a really anxiety-provoking place. And I see a tremendous, even just a 10-minute massage, people are, are so transformed. It's, it's really uh, remarkable. Um, massage therapy doesn't interfere with other medications. You can still take pain meds if you need to, but massage therapy sometimes will let you stretch out the time you need between pain meds. And massage therapy speeds healing because it increases circulation and uh, it helps you feel better. And you don't need to be ill or sick to have a massage. Um, massage therapy enhan enhances well-being. So massage therapy is good for everybody. Uh, some of the ways that massage therapy works, it increases the circulation of, of both the blood and the lymph. And the lymph system is kind of like the garbage collector of the body, but it doesn't really have a pump. Like the, uh, the heart pumps the blood throughout the, the body, but the lymph really relies on the muscles to pump it around. But when you're, say you're moving your muscles, you're also creating more waste products. The, the, the muscles uh, metabolizing. So massage therapy is kind of one way to uh, think about it in a way of taking your body to the cleaners, of getting that lymph circulated without you creating more waste products. It also helps with uh, venous return to the heart. Um, people who spend a lot of time standing or sitting and their blood circulation gets kind of sluggish. Uh, massage therapy can be really helpful for that. And it also uh, reduces edema when people have swelling for various reasons. Uh, massage therapy also reduces muscle tension very, very directly by working on the muscle fibrils. Because sometimes what happens, especially when people work like sitting in computers, they're in this sort of half contracted position. They're sort of holding their arms up a little bit, but not all the way up. So their muscles are kind of half contracted, and a lot of those muscle fibrils kind of forget that they're even contracted. So actually, this is something that we could do together, if you'd like, is just bring your, mus your shoulders all the way up, bring them all the way up to your ears, all the way, all the way up, and then <sighs> let them down. Try it one more time, breathe in, bring them all the way, all the way up, and then <sighs> let them go down. Because you need to really fully contract some of those muscles to get them to fully relax. Um, massage therapy also encourages relaxation by switching off the go, 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 fight or flight kind of part of the nervous system and turns the parasympathetic on, which is the, uh, I'd like to call it the rest and digest side of the autonomic nervous system. So uh, massage therapy is, uh, is a very direct way of, of getting your body to relax. And it also uh, provides a feeling of being uh, nurtured. I mean, a lot of touch is so important. People in this culture, you know, with all their little tech devices, and it, it's kind of like we have a, a high-tech, low-touch culture going on. So massage therapy is really a nice way for people to get touched in a safe and uh, supportive and nurturing way. Uh, what's also interesting is that when you do massage therapy, you're also uh, producing uh, endorphins and oxytocin, these feel-good chemicals in your brain. So it's, it, there was a really interesting study of um, uh, people in a nursing home and they were giving massage to infants and the almost the greater benefit was to the people giving the massage. I mean, the infants uh, benefited also, but uh, massage is, uh, is an intrinsically satisfying uh, thing to do. So that's one of, I think it's one of the reasons that I've been able to do it for 30 years, is that feeling of really helping somebody in a very real way. Um, massage therapy can reduce scar tissue and it makes tissue more pliant. Uh, it increases uh, the mobility in the joints. It helps uh, tremendously with any kind of back pain. A lot of people experience back pain. Um, it can ease the pain of arthritis and fibromyalgia, and it helps uh, 
athletes recover more quickly from injuries, like uh, people who do the, the bike races and stuff, they always get a massage every day. So it's, it's really important. And that ki when you're using your body in that kind of really uh, intense way, massage really helps you recover. It can also help uh, the discomforts of pregnancy, uh, can help ease labor pain, can help uh, postpartum recovery, and uh, there have been some really nice studies about infant massage helping digestion and sleep. And, uh, you know, we, we need food, we need air, we need love, and we need touch. Uh, this is a kind of the uh, pain goes, travels through certain fibers, and it's kind of a, kind of a slow fiber. Uh, and sometimes that light touch will actually get to the brain first before the pain signal and almost like a gate. The, b the brain can only process so many signals. So sometimes touch can actually circumvent, especially chronic pain in this way. So, you know, immediately, you know, if you, if you stub your toe or something, you, you, their instinct is to just rub it and it kind of changes the whole pain signal. So... Uh, uh, there was some really interesting uh, meta-analysis, which means they look at all the research uh, reports and they, they kind of see what the overall trend is from all of the research. And there was uh, statistically significant effects on state anxiety, which means if you're in doing something in particular that's making you anxious, massage therapy can help with that. But it also can help with trait anxiety, which is when you're kind of an anxious person. And uh, so massage therapy can help with that. And of course, uh, reduces blood pressure and heart rate, uh, pain reduction. And this was one that I found really interesting, that it helps with depression. And that the effects of massage therapy are similar to psychotherapy by itself. Now, psychotherapy and drugs together were more effective for depression, but massage therapy can be an effective treatment for depression. So now we're going to talk about the different modalities and we're gonna switch back and forth. And uh, I just have a couple of things oh, to say before please. you do um, the acupressure. Oh. I, I, I thought I'd give kind of an overview of modalities because um, we've only chosen about 15 to talk about, which is plenty for the hour that we have. But there are literally hundreds of name brand modalities of um, hands-on work. And um, Marcia and I have studied a lot of the same ones, and but we combine them in different ways. And um, we've also studied some very different ones from each other. Um, we've chosen this 15 or so to present to you because, first of all, in most cases they are uh, approaches that have really informed our practice. But second of all, um, it's um, because sometimes people have curiosity about like what is Feldenkrais versus Alexander or something like that. So we, um, we tried to combine what our imagined questions were. And that's my little intro to, we're going to pop back and forth with talking about the modalities. So we started with acupressure because this talk is m massage therapy A to Z. So, uh, and acupressure is something that I use quite a bit. And uh, acupressure uses the same points as uh, Chinese acupuncture. And um, it's really effective for uh, pain relief and for stimulating the body and also uh, balancing uh, the energy. I, a lot of times I use it kind of as a, almost like a diagnostic kind of technique. Like where is the person stagnant? Where is their energy low? Where is it flowing really well, you know, so the f kind of like one of the first things I do with someone is I, I'll do acupressure uh, along their spine and down their back and just get a sense of where, where things are in their body, what's going on with them. Um, it's also uh, 
We're going to do, we have the very last slide, we're going to teach you guys some very simple acupressure, self-acupressure points uh, for your own health. So uh, stay tuned for that. Okay, body, mind. This is actually a huge category. Um, and it is a category which recognizes what some people call the connection between the body and the mind. I mean, in fact, when I talk about it, I think more that um, uh, mind and body are one and the same. In fact, mind is a function of body, the way that information moves through our system, uh, just like emotions are also a function of body. And that we're more familiar with, that idea, because we know that hormones produce emotions, and so that is a body function. So. In the body-mind therapies, and I just named a couple up here for you, um, Hakomi and somatic experiencing. Hakomi is a kind of psychotherapy that takes the body into consideration for the uh, becoming more aware of one's self for insight, for um, affecting change. And somatic experiencing is a uh, a wonderful approach to resolving post-traumatic stress um, through body awareness and through some movement. So these body-mind therapies encourage attention to um, sensation and movement, and they can do that in a whole lot of ways. Can do it with touch, with breathing awareness, uh, with with movement, uh, body awareness exercises, and. It's, um, it's very powerful in, if a person is interested in resolving some emotional issues. Oh, and this one I'm talking about as well. Although both Marcia and I practice craniosacral therapy, um, craniosacral is a system of very subtle touches to, um, it says non-invasive techniques, but, and that's very true. Sometimes I've worked with people um, in craniosacral therapy, and they say, well, you're not doing anything, uh, because it might be just a, a super light touch on a person's head um, or on their sacrum. But what, um, there are two things that the touch tries to affect. One is to evaluate where the rhythm, the craniosacral rhythm of the body, um, so that includes the rhythm of the cerebral spinal fluid moving through the brain and all the way down to the sacrum um, around the, the spinal cord, because you know we have these membranes called the dura, which enclose the cerebral spinal fluid. At any rate, what you do is you have these light touches so that you can unwind little kinks in the different membranes of the central nervous system and evaluate how well the fluid is moving and where those areas that are somehow kinked up have to be freed up. Um, and people almost always say, wow, I'm just totally relaxed, almost in a trance state. Um, so it's good for that, but it's also good for anything associated with the central nervous system. So that can include eye difficulties or uh, learning disabilities or um, any dysfunction that has to do with the central nervous system. Yeah, I would just like to say that uh, Craniosacral is, it, it's profoundly relaxing. Um, if, you, if you ever get a chance to try it, you really should. It's like, it's like floating in the ocean. It's, it's really uh, a delightful state of being to finally get that relaxed. So uh, sometimes when I'm doing it, I'm thinking, oh my god, this person is so relaxed. Can I can I go on with the massage even? I mean, uh, I, you know, I need to do some more other parts, you know. So, I, I like to save it for last, so I don't not have to, you know, 
stir them up again somehow. But sometimes I'm, I'm st I start with it, so then I'm like, oh, well, now I've got to keep going. So. Uh, deep tissue. Was I going to talk about deep tissue? I think we'll both talk about it because it's something that we both do quite a bit. Um, deep tissue is kind of what it sounds like. It's dealing with the deeper muscle layers because you know the muscles are kind of layered and sometimes if you're doing kind of a light touch or a medium touch, you're not getting to those deeper layers of uh, musculature and there's a lot of uh, tension that's being stored there and in the fascia itself. Um, you could you could spend three days talking about fascia alone, but fascia is the connective tissue that covers all of the muscles and it covers all of the connections, all the connective tissue connecting the muscles and the tendons to the bones. Um, and as you warm up the body, as you work at these deeper levels, the fascia itself actually warms up and changes its texture. So um, I just, you know, I usually use uh, my forearm or my elbow um, to, to get to those deeper layers. And as do I, because, um, um, because it's very useful to use such strong tools. But there's a part of deep, deep tissue which I really love, um, which usually means using the fingertips. And it's going deeply in between the fibers uh, very, very carefully. And, um, you know, you think of the um, tissues as textiles, different kinds of textiles. And I go into the fibers and um, iron out the kinks deep, uh, deep into the muscle layers. And um, it's very satisfying to feel that change and it feels great in the body as well. Uh, so E, uh, I came up with uh, Esalen. Uh, this is the book that got me started uh, on my massage career way long ago in the last century. Um, this is the, uh, the massage book by George Downing and it came out of uh, Esalen and uh, the, the thing about Esalen massage, how it differs from, say, Swedish massage, is there's this, uh, this focus on the entire body. So there are a lot of full body strokes where you go from the soles of the feet all the way up to the top of the head, which is something that Swedish massage generally uses, that you do one part at a time. And so sometimes people feel a little compartmentalized after just Swedish massage. And if you do one of these long connecting strokes, People feel like they're a whole, their whole body, they're whole again. And um, I think this was one of the things that made massage therapy different for me as opposed to like physical therapy, which is also very much uh, interested in just parts, dealing with the part that's wrong or the parts, that this is a way to feel whole and that whole sort of, you know, holistic medicine so that you want to you want to deal with the whole body you don't want to deal with just parts uh, lymphatic drainage is something that we both do sometimes lymphatic drainage depending um, and I've also discovered there's lots of different ways to do this too there's a lot of different schools of thought about uh, lymph drainage and um, it's um, I, I love that, the textiles. So here we're dealing with a completely different layer from, you know, deep tissue, you're really down in the basement. Well, this is up in the attic. This is just under the skin. This is a very, very light work, but it's really, it's really about fluid dynamics. You know, it's kind of like setting up a wave because, you know, we really are very fluid creatures. We're really made up of a lot of watery substances and so the lymphatic drainage really gets to that layer and uh, again the, the lymph system deals with a lot of toxins and uh, debris and uh, the immune system is uh, it's, it's a way to affect all of those things I'm not going to say anything about that because I think you did a great job <laughs> Movement therapies, um, 
this again is a huge category. And I have, in fact, um, studied um, th these two, Alexander and Feldenkrais, and there are other ones that I had included, um, uh, but the, the slide didn't cooperate. Um, Alexander is a technique which is often used by performers. And um, it, they give the people who are studying it, it's called lessons, they give them lessons in walking, standing, sitting, and there's a hands-on component which helps people feel themselves in very subtle ways to realign the way they're holding their head, um, the way they're moving their body. Um, uh, Feldenkrais is a movement technique in another way which also has a hands-on component. And uh, Feldenkrais um, was, well, consists of repeating really simple movements. You don't even take, like say you might take your ear to your shoulder numerous times and um, you don't even take it to the end like you would in a stretch. You just do these little repeated movements and it retrains the system. They're very precise and repeated movements. And it, it retrains the system so that there's more flexibility, more mobility. Um, uh, the hands-on component does a similar thing. It helps people um, to move in new ways. Now, interestingly enough, both of these, Alexander and Feldenkrais, um, are named after the men who developed them. And they both had problems of their own, and they developed these systems to, um, to deal with the problems. I mean, Alexander was a, a, an Australian Shakespearean performer who lost his voice, and he found out he lost his voice when he was performing because of the way he was holding his head and the way he was speaking. Um, and Feldenkrais was, did martial arts and he injured himself and he had to find his way back to good mobility. So um, there's, you know, sometimes these absolute genius techniques come out of um, somebody's problems. I just also wanted to say about Feldenkrais that he was um, a structural engineer, I think. So he had this very, like, weights and pulleys kind of idea about how the body worked and uh, and and also he was a I think a judo master so it's kind of an interesting blend of things and he, he really uh, it, one of the things that Feldenkrais is really good for is uh, TMJ so um, again it's like this movement is a little bit off somehow and you can retrain your body to do these things uh, orthobionomy, um, this is a really interesting technique that I studied, um, I don't know, 20 years ago or something. And uh, what it is, um, it comes out of uh, osteopathy a little bit. The guy who kind of developed it was, a, was an osteopath. And what it is is release through positioning. So what happened was he had this very, he had a patient who he wasn't having much luck with and he kind of put him in a room and put a bunch of pillows under his knees and then forgot about him. <laughs> Went back 45 minutes later and the guy said, oh, my back feels great. It hasn't felt this good in years. So he kind of, uh, he kind of looked into that a more, little more deeply. And what it is is a lot of times it's understanding the way the muscle works and instead of stretching it and trying to stretch it out, you actually compress it. And in a way it's very similar to what we did with the shoulders where we brought it all the way up and then we let it all the way down. Uh, a lot of times I think about, you know how when the window gets stuck, it won't go down, you push it up a little more and then it goes down? So it, that's, that's kind of the idea behind it. And I, I have found it to be just tremendous, especially for the neck and shoulders and all kinds of parts of the body where uh, there's a really great psoas release and it's very simple and it's absolutely painless and uh, very effective. And back to and 
there are other techniques uh, like, I'm going to jump to polarity in a second, but there are other techniques that, that use um, positioning to release, and one of the ones I've studied is called strain, counter strain. It's very similar, and like Marsha loving to use orthobionomy, I love the, the strain, counter strain, because it, um, it's a painless way to get rid of pain. <laughs> And so polarity, now this is something I studied extensively in the early days of, of my, my study, and it's, um, it's based on Ayurvedic medicine, if any of you are familiar with that. That's the um, traditional Indian, East Indian approach to medicine. Um, and um, it, it has more than just the hands-on part, but the hands-on part uh, has a lot of um, point holding, usually two points, to balance positive, negative, and neutral energies. It sees all energy as, as, um, as having one of those aspects, and the ideal is to come into harmony. So um, I still use a lot of polarity and enjoy it very much, and reflexology. I also use reflexology a whole lot, oftentimes in conjunction with some of these other things like polarity or craniosacral therapy. And, you know, we haven't been mentioning this all along, but many of these modalities can be done over clothes. And many of them are done like deep tissue or Swedish, which we're about to talk about. Many of them are done um, with at least partial disrobing, if not complete. Anytime you use a lubricant, um, uh, then people take some or all of their clothes off. Reflexology is pressure point typically on the feet. Uh, sometimes, actually, you work on the hands or the ears. Those are two other places that have points which correspond to all the systems of the body, particularly the organ systems. And um, it says, you know, good for stimulating sluggish body systems. Well, there is a time that I have found it most useful in going into the hospital, which we have the privilege of doing, and working with people after surgery. And if any of you have had loved ones or you yourself have had surgery, you know that you have to get your digestive system going before they'll discharge you. Um, and so working on the feet in order to get that digestive system moving has proven, in my experience, to be very effective. I also uh, use reflexology in a little bit of a diagnostic way, too. Like if I'm working on someone Sometimes I'll go to their feet just to see what kind of information I can get from their feet. Like, is there low back pain? Is it from the spine, or is it more the hip, or what, what's really going on? And uh, it, 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 it amazes me how often the feet will tell me what's going on with someone. And uh, one of the nice things about re reflexology is that it's some, one of those things you can do for yourself, too. So. Okay, Swedish. Now, this is sort of the Hollywood idea of what a massage is, right? You know, uh, so stroking and kneading, which is also known as effleurage and petrissage, uh, tapping, tapotment, you know, where you see the guy, you know, chop, 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 chop. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's probably the blue plate special of uh, massage therapy. I think I've probably everybody does who does massage does some Swedish. Um, it's really great for circulation and, you know, getting the blood back to the heart. It's the venous return. It's just uh, terrific for that. And it's also, it was really interesting. There was a uh, recent study and they uh, compared, like, really specific uh, orthopedic massage for back pain to, you know, supposedly relaxation Swedish massage. And they didn't find much difference. They found that, mo that both systems worked pretty well. And again, I think it's that whole idea that it's, we're talking about the whole body. We might be just t touching part of it, but it has effects throughout the whole body.
Hmm. Swedish, I, I, um, I think you did a great job with it, Marcia. Um, I think probably most of you are quite familiar with it. It's, um, um, uh, it is often the modality into which I integrate many other modalities because people just love um, the soothing touches. Um, uh, and then I, I can use it and integrate acupressure, integrate craniosacral therapy, just love to combine different things. Traeger, uh, another modality named after the person who developed it, Milton Traeger. Um, Traeger is a, typically a person lies on the table with their clothes on and the practitioner does uh, really fluid, gentle, rocking movements. And so, you know, a practitioner might take your arm and have it go in all of the directions it wants to go and then feel restrictions and rock into those restrictions a little bit. You can also do this yourself, just as I am. And I sometimes, if I, you know, if, if my arms are uh, feeling overused, whether it be from computer use or doing massage, um, I'll do a little Traeger movement. You can do it at any time for yourself. Well, we're coming to the end of the alphabet. <laughs> and... Uh, Zero balancing, uh, again, was uh, developed by a guy whose name was Fritz Smith. And uh, he had the distinction of his father was a chiropractor. So he grew up with very structured touch, very intelligent touch. And then he kind of developed this method. And it's, again, very, very light touch, where you're like holding two points, so it's kind of similar to polarity. But I think what he, in his genius, added is this little bit of traction. So say you're holding somebody's ankles, and then you just pull just a little bit. And the whole, you can just sense the whole lower back just expanding and relaxing. Again, it's one of those things I do at the end, and it's 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 really uh, very effective and very relaxing. Uh, the bottom line is that you know what's what's killing us today is stress, right? I mean, all of our diseases have stress as their underlying, you know, contributing factor at very least. And so, massage is an antidote to stress. So it's the the perfect uh, the perfect treatment for today's lifestyle. And. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, uh, because I teach a lot, um, a lot of times I'll teach, say, craniosacral therapy, in which the practitioner will b be putting their fingertips at the base of somebody's skull, and um, and the the students will say, "Oh, that's just like acupressure," or um, uh, or that's um, just like that Swedish stroke I like so much. And in fact, what I want to point out about these different modalities that we've been talking about is that sometimes the touches feel very similar, but in subtle ways, the hands of the practitioner are doing different things. So that, yes, sometimes called the intention. Um, so that it sometimes, um, you might be just, like maybe in acupressure, you might be just trying to open up the flow of energy at the base of the skull. In, um, in Swedish, you might be doing a gentle pull in order uh, to give a little traction to the muscles. In craniosacral therapy, you might be untwisting uh, some kind of twist or kink in the dura mater the membranes around the, the central nervous system, and our fingertips are in precisely the same place. So we have studied all these different things, and um, uh, 
put them together depending on our assessment of the patient's needs and, and use the approach that we think is best to resolve what the patient needs to resolve. And we also get input from our colleagues here at OSHER um, because one of the wonderful things about working here is that we, um, we get to talk with the other providers, the other practitioners here about asking, well, what do you think? You know, what do you think would be helpful? So the things that we've presented, they're not even everything that Marcia and I have studied, but it's a very good sampling. Okay, so we wanted to give you guys something to take home with you. So, um, actually, I don't know if I can do it and hold the microphone at the same time. You want me to hold the yeah, microphone? Yeah, hold the microphone, yeah. <laughs> so this first point, this is a really great point. It's right here in the web of your fingertips, between your thumb and your forefinger. And if this is a really great point for um, headaches or digestive disturbances or even toothache, um, I, I demonstrated this point uh, when I met my, my husband's, uh, at that time, 13-year-old nephew in a Chinese restaurant, and there he was with his mohawk, and <laughs> this was a long time ago. <laughs> and he said he had a headache, and I did this point, and he went, wow, it's gone. You know, so this point really works. <laughs> so um, if you do it to yourself, the, uh, the intention of the pressure is going towards the pointer finger. And uh, an interesting thing to do is to see how it is on either hand. See if, you know, get a sense of uh, sometimes one point is fuller or congested and the other point is deficient. And if you go back and forth, generally you can get the energy to balance out. Do you, do you want to talk about these points? Why don't you? Okay, just okay, <coughs> okay. So uh, I, another uh, a couple of really great points, uh, again, for headache or if you spent uh, too much time on the computer, which probably a lot of you do. And uh, one way to do this uh, is take your, uh, say take your left hand and put it under your right uh, elbow. And then I'm going to turn around and show you. So you're going to just make your, make your hand into a little bit of a claw and just put it on the top of your shoulder blade and just let your hand fall forward and as much as you let your hand fall forward you'll 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 get a nice deep ah I heard a nice <sighs> and so it's right in the, the, the corner of the scapula there and then another really good point and this might be a little easier w when you're lying down in bed at home and it's on both sides either side of uh, the neck and the, the top of the occiput. And uh, especially, you know, you can make little circles here. You know, you spend too much time in front of the computer. There's also a lot of eye strain. This is really a great point for eye strain. Um, again, if you're doing too much on the computer, just right here in the middle of the wrist, there's a little indentation right there, and you can press there. This is, this is kind of a better one if, if you're doing it to someone because you can hold both points together. You can't really do it on yourself that well. But uh, another really nice point is right here up in the, uh, the elbow, kind of in between the two bones. This is a, a really nice point. You can get in there. And so it's on the top, the top of the arm, right in between. And a way to find it if, is if you turn like if you bring your thumb up, you can feel it turning. So it's the top of that radius muscle. Really nice. And then this last point, stomach 36, if you have a stomach ache, it's really nice. It's right, um, I think I can do this. Uh, right, um, right below the kneecap. I think I'll sit down. So if you, if you take your hands and put them right below the kneecap, you'll, you'll, you'll feel a little indentation right there. Again, it's between the two bones. And this is a really, um, this is a really good point for any kind of digestive disturbances. And it's on both sides. All right, so we have a few minutes left for questions. Let me open up the floor. During the summer, I uh, 
had TMJ and it hasn't gone away and I know it's not going to go away but I'd like to know what I could do to relieve it a little I don't want to go to the dentist because I can't open my mouth that wide without it hurting or clicking um, well your dentist might have some ideas for you too how to deal with this um, sometimes they give you a night guard some, something to put in your mouth while you're sleeping yeah, but um, another thing that you can do yourself is you can work on this little muscle right here. This is actually the most used muscle in the whole body. Because, <laughs> you know, actually just, because if this muscle's relaxed, your jaw is open. So think about how much you use this muscle, just closing your mouth, open and closing, talking, yapping, eating, all this stuff. So you can just uh, make little circles right here in that muscle and do it on both sides. Um, if you can get a Feldenkrais, it, but they have Feldenkrais classes actually, and it's a group class, or you can uh, find a Feldenkrais uh, instructor, because Feldenkrais is really useful for this kind of thing. Um, I, I, I'm not qualified to teach it. I don't know that, that you are. No, yeah. Right, you need to go to a qualified Feldenkrais practitioner, and uh, I think they really can help you with it. And, um, you know, I don't know the specifics of what's going on with you, but I would think that it could go away, you know, <laughs> or it could be greatly relieved, um, even, even by massage, you know, seeing a massage therapist who knows how to gently work with this, with the masseter muscle and the, the buccinators. So I think you have a few options, but the idea of Feldenkrais is excellent, yeah. So this guy. I, I just want to say that everything can get better. I mean, just because you've had it for a while doesn't mean it has to stay that way. There's always, change is always possible. Hi, if I can run in two here. Um, one is, you know, when these books, like say your your massage book was written and when massage really gained an ascendancy or rediscovery here, you know, during the hippy dippy days, why everybody was a little slimmer. And I'm wondering when you're doing your Swedish massage or your Esalen massage, and there's quite a bit of adipose tissue between the skin and the muscle, how do you get to that muscle without, you know, doing a really digging in? And then the other part is, I'm sure you're probably familiar with some of the old hippie hot springs, Harbin Hot Springs being one of them. That's the New Age Conscious Church, and they, you know, I'm on their mailing list, and they send out all these, these things out, and some sound really bogus, and how do you determine legitimate massage therapy from the stuff that's just, you know, came out from somebody's hat. Well, let me just say that um, one of the things to come out of Harbin Hot Springs was a, a technique called Watsu, which is the most, the most relaxing, wonderful, thing I have ever experienced. I mean, I took one six-hour class, and I was like, oh, my God, this is fabulous. What it is is it's massage in the water. So there's no gravity. There's no resistance. It takes you to a place that's oh, fabulous. <laughs> How do you determine? Um... I don't really know the answer to that other than um, the things that, y you know, I'm a member of the American Massage Therapy Association, and so we have um, education that's been vetted in some way, and so whatever I've studied through th that organization I know is uh, legitimate uh, massage therapy. But, you know, and the thing about massage therapy, th I mean, everybody's making it up as they go along in a way. I mean, it's... Um, 
the proof is in the pudding. If you experience it and it works for you, then it works. Um, what was the first part of your question? Oh, adipose, oh, adipose tissue. Um, again, it's really, a, it's really fluid dynamics. It's not really, I mean, some of the largest people I've had have been actually the easiest to work on. I mean, it, it's, it really has more to do with the person's state of mind, how tight they are, than their, their body composition. Yeah, I definitely second that. A lot of times with heavier people, I just, um, uh, I actually use lighter pressure. There's no need to dive in. But in terms of, if you're interested in taking a workshop or studying something, um, I usually try to talk to the teacher. You know, see if that's possible or exchange emails, ask questions, see how they answer them and how that satisfies you. And then and then go from there. So I think we're just about out of time. I hope if there are any other questions, we'll be, um, we'll be here for just a couple of minutes, I think, clearing, you know, picking things up. Um, I know there's a sign up sheet here for in case you're interested in more information. And I thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you.